Well, let's pray. <coughs> oh, Father God, it is a wonderful joy and blessing to be here this morning and to sing you praises, to sing of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his incarnation of God coming in flesh to be fully and holy God and fully and holy man. What a privilege to just take a moment, even in July, to celebrate Christmas a bit, to celebrate that most important day when Christ was born. We celebrate that not just because a baby was born, but because a baby was born who became a man and throughout that process and continuing forward was sinless, was blameless in terms of sin, in terms of the fulfillment of the law that you have given the nation of Israel, that you have given the world, the moral law that we too live by in this day. What a blessing to honor and to remember that Christ came in the flesh, not just to live a sinless life, but to be tempted and to overcome that temptation, to face the temptation of Satan himself and defeat him in that moment. But ultimately, and most importantly, to defeat him in that most important moment, that moment on the cross. To any point, Christ could have removed himself, could have let himself down, could have freed him from bondage to that cursed tree. And yet he didn't. He remained there, and he remained faithfully there, nailed to that cross with the nails that our flesh deserved, the nails of our sin and our iniquities. And Lord, we celebrate Christmas not just because of the birth and not just because he was sinless and not just because he died, but most importantly and ultimately culminating in that moment three days later when he rose from the grave. That moment, that moment right there, Lord, is why we can stand and we can sing joy to the world. And even maybe more importantly than that, we can say joy to me, joy to Jared. Because it is a true joy that Christ died for me, that he became sin, that I might become the very righteousness of God. Lord, we praise you this morning and we worship you this morning in light of these truths, recognizing what you have done for us, that we might be free, that we might have a resurrection life now, at least spiritually, as we are spiritually risen into this new person, this new being with the eternal and unbreakable hope that a physical resurrection will come and that we will see Christ face to face. Lord, I thank you for all of this in his precious and wonderful name. Amen. Well, for our scripture reading this morning, I invite you to turn with me to Psalm 31. Psalm 31 this morning, and we'll enjoy the whole psalm this morning, this entire psalm of King David, Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief. My soul and my body also for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, 
I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O oh Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to shale. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and work for those who take refuge in you, in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Let us pray. Well, Father God, as we read this song, we can see, we can read, we can feel, we can sense this heart of David who at the time of writing this was in a time of, of despair, a time in which he felt broken, rejected by all those around him, utterly alone in this world. And yet in that loneliness, in that despair, as he's surrounded by enemies, Lord, he cries out to you and he knows and he trusts that as he cries out to you, you hear him. That all his days you have been storing up good, you have been storing up blessings for him. And he encourages those who sing this song or read this song to take courage as they wait for you. Lord, all of us in this room are waiting for something from you. We have some prayer request, something, even if it's not spoken to you, that is on our hearts. We are waiting to hear yes or no or to see what your will is in any given situation. And as we wait in these moments, Lord, I pray that we would take a moment to cry out to you, but also to be courageous as we face the enemies all around us whether they be actual people that we call enemies or whether they be spiritual matters as we fight a spiritual war against things that are not flesh or blood. Lord, give us courage and give us the comfort and the peace that comes from crying out to you even when we are at our lowest. Lord, we pray in this moment now for Echo Davis, who is dealing with ovarian cancer, a stage three cancer, Lord. And Lord, we don't know your will in that situation, but it seems like she's approaching the end. and she deals with hospice care, I pray that they would do well for her, to comfort her, to treat her well. I pray for the family that surrounds her that they would continue to be able to pour love into her. And that, Lord, if it is your will, she would make it to October. She would make it to her 100th birthday and have that blessing. But, Lord, if it's your will and you call her home sooner than that, Lord, we are thankful for that and grateful for that, for someone who has been a dear friend to this church. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would help whatever medical professionals are involved to help make wise decisions to best care for Echo in her time of illness. And Lord, we're thankful that what she's going through now 
is but a temporary, a momentary affliction in the grand scheme of the hope and the joy and the glory and the wonder to come as she enters into the presence of you and your Son and the full manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray these things, we ask you for these things, in Jesus' name, amen. What well, a transition here to announcements, just to mention Echo, uh, as you heard in the prayer, if you didn't know already, she's dealing with uh, stage three ovarian cancer. I don't know all the details from that. Uh, Heidi just mentioned it yesterday during our board meeting. I wasn't aware of it. Apparently the post from her daughter on Facebook that mentioned it is somewhat old. I don't know if it's a month old or... No. Okay, a couple weeks old. So I haven't heard anything since then. But keep Echo in mind in your prayers. There is a card on the table. Uh, if you haven't already had a chance to sign that or write a quick note in that, please do so. I'll be doing that later. Uh, that we'll be able to send to her and get her away just so she knows we're thinking of her and, uh, and praying for her. And I know she'll appreci appreciate that. Uh, last time I spoke to her, which was... Uh, which was quite a while ago. I know she had uh, some fond things to say about this church, uh, and I know she'd appreciate that. I know not everybody had a chance to meet Echo, but I know she was an important part of this ministry for, for some time. Uh, transitioning to something a little happier, uh, I have a note here from Audrina. Uh, the church has been generous enough to pay for her to go to camp at Grace Adventures or to go to Paradise Ranch where she gets to learn about God, learn about Jesus, but to do so specifically through horsemanship, and uh, she gets to ride horses, and I was hoping to get the same horse she had last year, I believe his name is Joe, so she's really hoping to get Joe again, because she really uh, enjoyed her time, but uh, she did write a thank you note that I wanted to share, and I'll post it up there later after the service, uh, she says, Dear Church, thank you so much for paying for me to go to Grace Adventures, last year I had so much fun, I can't wait to go back, I'm so excited to make new memories and lots of friends. I love Audrina. So, quick note from her. I know she really appreciates that. Uh, her last day of camp is August 5th, uh, and so I think she's there for about five days. So, very end of this month, maybe the first day of August, she goes to that. I should probably figure that out, but I'll be praying for her uh, if she has that. I know she'll have a good time. Uh, last thing I want to mention is Sunday school. Uh, fall is coming up. Uh, we don't always do the traditional Sunday school start in fall, uh, but I just wanted to, I have a note here in the bulletin, just let me know if you have interest. There's a few people who have expressed interest, but uh, the more I know who's interested and maybe what exactly we might be interested in discussing, uh, the better idea I'll have for what Sunday school might look like in the future. So if you haven't already expressed interest to me, please do so. I look forward to hearing from you if that's the case. Other than that, I'll be quiet now. We'll continue our worship as led by the, the music ministry team here, and then we'll move on to our message after that. A few years before the turn of this century, Alan Beals, an English teacher at Iowa State University, was interested in a plaque attached to the old state gym. It was under a layer of dust and bird droppings, under that on this plaque was a tribute to a man named Jack Trice. Some of you might be familiar with the story. Some of you won't be, and that's, I think, good. Professor Beals assigned some students to learn more about this Jack Trice. He had never heard the name and wasn't familiar with this person. He wanted to know why he was honored with a plaque on the wall of the gym. And they discovered many forgotten things about this unknown figure. They learned that he was a sophomore in 1923. He was married. He had an average score of 90% as an animal husbandry major. He also played football. And he was a young black man. Because of that, he was not allowed to play in the first two major games of the season. In fact, he only ever played one game for the Iowa State Cyclones. When his team and coaches rallied behind him, he was allowed to play against Minnesota while they were in Minneapolis. Seventy years later, the name Jack Trice, despite being on a plaque, meant very little to the students and the faculty at Iowa State. In that game against Minnesota, Iowa State was ahead 14-10. to 10. 
and Minnesota had the ball, and they ran this play that caught Iowa's defense off guard, and the defensive line fell apart. And Trice rushed in to close the gap, and he stopped the play. But he fell on his back, and three Minnesota players charged him, running right over him. Some said it was an accident. Some teammates thought it was on purpose because he was black. Trice was carried from the field. He returned to Iowa lying on a bed of straw in a railroad car. He was taken immediately to the college hospital where he was told he would recover, and he was sent home. But he died two days later with hemorrhaging lungs and internal bleeding. The day Trice was buried, friends found in his jacket pocket a note that he had written the night before in the Minneapolis hotel room, the night before his first game, they labeled it, my thoughts just before the first real college game of my life. It read, the honor of my race, my family, and myself is at stake. Everyone is expecting me to do big things. I will. My whole body and soul are to be thrown recklessly about the field. Every time the ball is snapped, I will be trying to do more than my part. That's courage. He stepped onto that field as the first black man to play football at Iowa State. He stepped onto that field with an entire team wanting to hurt him, not just because he was on the opposing team, but because in their minds his skin color made him opposition in life. And even though carrying a pig skin down a field is not ultimately very significant. And even though it's not a cause that I would say, most would say is worth dying for, there's something about somebody giving his life for anything that speaks about conviction and about courage. Courage and conviction are the topic of our message this morning. Courage and conviction are the reason that Jack Trice had a funeral in the football stadium with over 4,000 people there. Courage and conviction are the reason that he had a plaque in his honor on the gym. And it's the reason that after that plaque was rediscovered, some short time later, the school named their football stadium after him. It's one of the few stadiums that's not named, even to this day, for the biggest donors. It's one of the only stadiums named after a black player. And a black player, I'll remind you, only played for a small part of a single game. He was a man of courage and conviction who believed in something enough to abandon his own self-pleasure to see it come to pass, willing to give everything it took to make his time on that field mean something. As he said, for his race, for his people, for himself. That is a spirit that I think is common. It's a common characteristic of all of God's greatest people throughout the history of biblical revelation. When in the book of Numbers, the spies went into the land that God was to give them and they came back reporting it to be full of giants that made the Israelites seem like grasshoppers. Joshua and Caleb said, no problem, let's go get it. Deborah, the judge, believed God had promised victory in battle in Judges 4 and rallied the army and led them to victory in that battle. And there's in 1 Samuel 17 this marvelous story of a young boy who had a handful of rocks and a slingshot and said, it's only a giant and God is going to give the Philistines into our hands. A young boy who went out there and twirled that slingshot around and won a war. He had conviction. He was willing to stake his life on it. Or there's the three young men in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who are willing to take their life or give their life, stake their life on the principle that it was only proper to worship God and to not bow before any idol or any man. And they walked into a furnace, ready to die for what they believed in, unwilling to bow to a false god. 
as we've studied the book of Acts, we've been finding repeatedly that these people depicted in this history had convictions that they were willing to die for. God's greatest people have always believed their cause was worth dying for. And Paul was one of those people. We come today to Acts 21 with the Apostle Paul finishing up his first missionary journey. And it zeroes in, or he zeroes in, on the city of Jerusalem. And we'll spend this week and at least one more week looking at what we will begin today, which is to see what it looks like to have courageous conviction. Paul had just finished saying goodbye to the elders of Ephesus, knowing that he was to go to Jerusalem, and knowing that persecution awaited him there. And for quite a while at that point, every step he took, every town he came into, the Holy Spirit kept testifying to him that bonds and affliction awaited him. But that did not <laughs> stop him. As much as he realized the danger waiting at Jerusalem, as much as his heart burned to reach the city of Rome and to use Jerusalem only as a stop and then to go to Rome, as much as he knew that the saints loved him and appreciated him, he still didn't stop because he had a conviction and he had the courage to see it through. For several years, at this point, he had been collecting money to give to the poor saints in the Jerusalem church. And he collected it from all of the mostly Gentile churches. And it was a twofold project. One, it was to show the Gentile churches, or to show that the Gentile churches loved the Jewish church, that they cared for these <coughs> believers. And second, it was to meet the needs of the poor saints there. That was his conviction. And Paul believed that God had given him this goal and this cause and this objective, and Paul pursued it. He saw the Jerusalem church like it was as this beleaguered or besieged garrison that was cut off from supplies and struggling a church that was weary from persecution, and poverty, and famine. And he saw that the possibility was there to not only go and give them the money, but also relieve the physical need. But even more than that, to also inject some spiritual blood and <coughs> spiritual energy into this church that was suffering from persecution this church that the Apostle Paul undoubtedly saw as a church that was successful in reaching the people that he actually cared the most about, the Jewish people. But it wasn't a safe thing for him to do because all over the world, the hierarchy, the leadership of Jerusalem had hated Paul. From place to place, it was these people with their power centered in Jerusalem that drove him out of every town, often trying to kill him. And now he's going to go into the fry, from the frying pan and into the fire here, directly into Jerusalem. He's going to walk into the main headquarters of this whole operation, into Jerusalem itself. And everyone kept telling him what he was walking into. And he knew what he was walking into. And the Holy Spirit repeatedly told him, but he had this conviction, he had this purpose, he had this cause. And he had the courage to see that through without worrying about the consequences. That's the courage of conviction. You have a purpose. And you follow it. Safety comes long after obedience. Safety really isn't even a factor for the Apostle Paul, at least. As we look at chapter 21, we see Paul's courage of conviction. And it's a tremendous lesson for me, I, I believe, and I trust will be for you to see this man that he had such crystal clear objectives. This man who marched toward those objectives with no fault for anything but meeting them. From getting that goal, from rushing the gap, and doing what needed to be done. I think as we'll see in our text, there's four aspects of courageous conviction. Courageous conviction first knows its purpose. Second, it cannot be diverted. Those are the two we'll focus on today. Third, it pays any price. And fourth, it affects others. 
The courage of conviction, first of all, knows its purposes. You cannot have courage if you don't have the conviction. There has to be an objective. There has to be a goal. There's got to be a purpose that you're working towards in which you can express that courage. And so that's the conviction itself. Paul was pursuing his goal to bring financial aid to Jerusalem, despite promised persecution to come. We can see that in, in uh, chapter 20, chapter 20, verses 22 through 24. We see here a snapshot of, of these things that have been leading into this moment where he's finally ready to go to Jerusalem. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That is his conviction. And so as we approach this text, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's got the money and the men from each area of the Gentile church, as well as Luke, who's writing these things down as they go. And he's concluded his sad farewell to the elders of Ephesus, and he sets off to go to Jerusalem. And at that point, we pick up verse 1 of chapter 21. And in these first three verses, we'll see the fact that the courage of conviction knows its purpose. And it's just sort of implied here. Because in these verses, we have this recording of the journey they take from Miletus towards Jerusalem. But it shows the fact that Paul was on a journey towards an objective. Verse 1. And when we had parted from them and set sail... We came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. When it speaks of parting them, when at last we parted them, that's the Ephesian elders. The Greek literally translates to, after we tore ourselves away from them. And it's this beautiful little description that shows us that these Ephesian elders didn't want to let Paul go. And Paul didn't want to let them go. They had this bond, this relationship that had been formed over years. And that ministry was vitally important to Paul and something he loved and cared about. And yet he had this conviction. He had this calling to move on to this ministry of providing financial aid. And so it was difficult. But they tore themselves away. That phrase is also used in Luke 22, verse 41. It's the same word to speak of our Lord tearing himself away from his disciples at Gethsemane. It speaks of a love bond which is hard to sever. It's almost physically hard to sever is the notion there. And so they have this sad and difficult parting. And after that they sail to Kos, then Rhodes, then Patera. Which means, if you look at a map, that they sailed along the coast. Which indicates, I think, that they're in a smaller boat, something that has to stay in shallower waters. And they arrive at Patera, which was a port city where the Xanthus River emptied into the Mediterranean Sea. And that meant larger ships could be found there. At verse 2, And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. Now, this was going to be a non-stop trip from Patera to Phoenicia, which is our major clue that they must have been on a larger ship. To do this, they would need a larger ship to set sail through some of the deepest waters in the sea, at least in that part of the sea. But another reason we think it's large is in verse 3. It says at the end of verse 3 that it unloaded its cargo entire. And verse 4 then says that they stayed there seven days. Now any ship that needed seven days to unload must have been a large ship. And so very likely it's a large ship that they're on at this time and they could go straight across. And so he sails and he's pursuing his course to Jerusalem. It's the simple narrative here and yet it has lying underneath it this tremendous truth. 
And the Apostle Paul was accepting a tremendous challenge of bearing this gift to the Jerusalem church. The Apostle Paul never lived a day of his life, as far as I can tell, from the time of his conversion to the time that they beheaded him. He never lived a day that I could find in Scripture when he wasn't going somewhere to do something. Even when you read of him being in a place for years at a time, he's writing to these different churches that he has plans to go, that he has plans to see them, that if the Lord wills, that he would go and see them once again or perhaps meet them for the first time. That was so consuming his passion for going and for reaching people with the gospel of the grace of God that he would die for it he would just trade one of those things in for another constantly moving constantly reaching people constantly ministering trying to spread the gospel as far and wide as he possibly could if you ask most Christians today to name their God-given goal or objective most probably wouldn't have an answer. But the only time that you really can get that depth of courage that we see from the Apostle Paul or any of these other believers in the book of Acts, the only way you really get that depth of courage is when you have that depth of commitment to an objective, to a goal, to a purpose in mind. It was a question of conviction which preceded the act of courage. And you can't just say to Christians, be courageous, especially in our culture. Because they can run around or we can run around and, and say, I'm going to be courageous. Well, the question is, courageous about what? If you don't have an objective, you never end up in a situation where you have to be courageous. You just sit content and comfortable. Courage does not come from sitting on the bench. It comes from getting on the field. It comes from standing face to face with the opposition in the game saying, my whole body and soul are to be thrown recklessly about the field, saying every time the ball is snapped, I will be trying to do more than my part. We have to go to the field. It's not a football field. It's a mission field, whatever that looks like, foreign or domestic. It's a mission field, and we stand there, and we will face the opposition, and we will, and we do that, then have the opportunity to be courageous and say, I will give all of myself. I, by the grace of God, will do more than my part. But so many Christians choose to sit on the bench, and they sit on the bench, and they wonder why they don't have any courage, or why they don't have opportunity to do something bold and powerful for the Lord. And all they're doing is sitting on the sidelines. And I say that knowing that sometimes it can be hard to know exactly what our objective should be. But Paul, I think, can help us in a general sense, and the Holy Spirit can help us with the specifics as we examine our lives and our own unique personal situations that God has put us in. Philippians 3, I think, will serve as a good starting point there. If we were to say, all right, Paul, I want to get in on this objective thing. I want a purpose. I want a goal. Give me an idea of what to do. What is my objective in life? What Apostle Paul should be my goal? And we could talk first about the general specific objective. We don't have to get too specific at first. We don't have to say specifically right now that our objective is to bring a bag of money to Jerusalem. That's specific. That's Paul's specific objective. But there's a broader sense that we can explore this further. In Philippians 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says this. He's in the middle of talking, but he says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul says there, I'll tell you my general overall spiritual objective is that it is that I may know him, that I may know Christ. And if you're looking around for a good objective, I would suggest try that one. Know Jesus. Get to know Christ, your Savior, intimately. I think that's a good objective. My objective is to know him. And of course, we know him through prayer, 
We know him through the Bible. And knowing the Bible isn't the objective. It's great, but that's not the objective. The Bible is the means to accomplishing the objective, which is, again, to know Christ. Just to know the Bible in itself doesn't mean anything unless the God of the Bible becomes to me all that he wants to be through his revelation. So my goal is not to know the Bible. My goal is to know him. But in order to know him, I have to know his word. And then in a general sense, Paul expresses a deeper goal. He's saying, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know everything there is. I want to put myself, as it were, into Jesus Christ. I want to know the expression of his resurrection power. I want to feel the pain of his sufferings as I suffer for his sake. <clears throat> I want to know all there is of him. Resurrection, life, and suffering, and death. Life and death, resurrection, suffering, joy and pain. This is the dynamic of the Christian faith, the life of the follower of Jesus Christ. So that's a broad goal. That's an objective you can leave here today. You can leave here saying, if there's one thing I'm going to do, it is going to be to know Jesus Christ more deeper, more fully than ever before, to know the power of his resurrection today, and to know the fellowship of his sufferings today. As for the specifics, that's up to you and the Lord, however that works out. A goal of mine, an objective of mine, is to feed the flock, to preach the word. For you, that might mean something else. Perhaps it's winning an unsaved spouse to Christ or a co-worker to Christ. Perhaps it's your worldly treasures. To use those to help offer eternal blessings to other people. Perhaps it's to pour the love of Christ into the hearts of your kids or your grandkids. Whatever it is, the question then is, are you willing to pay any price to do that? To sacrifice your own self-will? To sacrifice your own pleasure? To do anything for that objective that the Lord gives you? Not that you just come up with on your own, but that the Lord gives you. And we'll see the Apostle Paul use that language in just a moment. I think of the Bible teacher who taught so well, and a young man came and said, I'd give the world to be able to teach like that. And the teacher said, good, that's what it will cost. You find the objective, you find the conviction that the Holy Spirit gives to you that comes out of knowing Christ and his resurrection and his sufferings. You find that objective and you go for it. You have the courage to reach for it, to fight for it, to die for it. You never have an objective. You're not going anywhere. And you'll never have the occasion to know what it is to express courage and to be able to set your will aside to accomplish what it is that God has laid in your heart. So first of all, then the courage of conviction knows its purpose. Secondly, the courage of conviction cannot be diverted. You can tell how deep one's conviction is by how fast you can get them off track. The courage of your convictions has to do with what it takes to divert you from them. The courage of conviction, if it's genuine, cannot be diverted. Now look at this in the case of Paul, verse 3 again. Acts 21, verse 3. When he had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. They land at Tyre, there on the coast of Syria, and are not far from Jerusalem now. And verse 4 then says, And having sought out the disciples, having sought out the disciples, Paul and this group that he was with, they search out fellow Christians, though likely strangers, considering that the church in Tyre was not a directly Pauline-founded church. 
Again, not directly a Pauline-founded church. The church in Tyre was started as part of the overflow of persecution of Stephen when the saints in Jerusalem scattered. And you remember that was the Apostle Paul overseeing that. That was Paul, the Pharisee, overseeing that and approving the persecution and the murder of Stephen. And it's out of that, that persecution of followers of the way, persecution of Christians, became rampant and Christians scattered. They leave Jerusalem. And it's because so many Christians left Jerusalem, some of them went to Tyre and a church there was founded. And so we see that the Apostle Paul, even before his conversion, even before he was saved, had a pretty powerful impact in starting churches. But he probably doesn't know many of these believers, if any of these believers in Tyre. So the group arrives in this new town, and they don't do what most people do when they arrive in a new town. They don't do what Elise and I do when we're traveling. They don't say, well, what are some fun things we can do here? How can we entertain ourselves? What's new and unique about this place? They say, where are God's people? Where are the fellow believers? Who can we fellowship with? Who can we minister to? They seek out these Christians. Verse 4, and having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Now, this isn't anything new. Everywhere he's gone, people have been telling him the same thing. And now he hears it from those in Tyre, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And they tell them that, as the text says, through the Spirit. So far we've seen that the Holy Spirit has warned Paul that there would be persecution ahead. But we haven't seen the Holy Spirit directly command Paul not to go to Jerusalem. The question here then is whether the believers in Tyre were speaking a direct command to Paul from the Holy Spirit. Is that what it means when it says that they, they told him not to go to Jerusalem through the Spirit? But I don't think that's the case here. What I think we're seeing is the supernatural gift of prophecy on display, this gift of prophecy that was given just to the early Christians. No longer a gift today, but in the early founding of, of Christianity. Both the Jewish church and the body of Christ church had this gift of prophecy. And some of these believers in Tyre prophesied that Paul would go to Jerusalem and he would be persecuted. And so out of love for him and out of care for him, I think they're advising them, saying if you go there, you're going to be persecuted. So, so don't go. I don't think that means that the Holy Spirit is trying to forbid them from going. The Holy Spirit gives them a prophecy, and they do with that what they think is best, to encourage him to stay, where he's loved and cared for and appreciated. And I'm sure these people, who, who probably most of them have never met the Apostle Paul, some of them went to Tyre, founded this church because of Paul, would be pretty interested in getting to know him and seeing how he's changed and hearing of his story of how he came to Christ. And so they encourage him to stay. But yet some people do suggest, some scholars, some teachers do suggest that Paul was disobedient going to Jerusalem. That at this moment the Holy Spirit was commanding him not to go to Jerusalem. And let's assume that's true for just a moment. If that's true, which is possible because certainly Paul was not a perfect man. We've seen him make mistakes even during his missionary trips. We've seen that he is human, that he fails miserably just like every other person that God uses fails. So they say he disobeyed, but let's sort of face that. If that's the case, that was a mistake made out of love. And if you're going to make a mistake, I suppose that's one of the better kinds of mistakes to make. A mistake made out of love. A mistake made out of selflessness. Because he knew this might cost him his life. He knew that all these plans to go to Rome and then go to Spain might be halted right there. So he made the decision out of love and out of selflessness. An absolute overpowering love for the Jewish church caused him to do what he did. So that's worst case scenario. He was disobedient, but he did it selflessly out of love. But I still don't think he made a mistake in this case. I don't actually think it's true that the Holy Spirit was telling him not to go. First of all, his life was lived 
in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. You read his letters, you read his epistles, and he talks a whole lot about being in tune in the Spirit, of walking in the Spirit. And I cannot see the Apostle Paul all of a sudden becoming this carnal person without any indication from God that he had turned from following the Spirit to following the flesh. He lived his life in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Secondly, his reasons for going to Jerusalem were the right kind of reasons. His motives seemed pure. And I think that it's hard to get an impure act out of a pure motive if you're really plugged into the Holy Spirit. Listen to this and then tell me if you hear the Holy Spirit directly saying, do not go. We go back to verse 20. Those same verses from earlier. It's chapter 20, I mean. Chapter 20, verse 22 and following. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value or as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems to me that this passage is not the Holy Spirit saying, don't go, but instead it's the Holy Spirit saying, now when you get to Jerusalem, when you arrive in Jerusalem, these are the things that you will face. The Holy Spirit knew he was going. Paul talks like, I'm going to Jerusalem. I believe it's the Holy Spirit that sent him there. And it was a case not of prohibition, but of preparation that's happening here. Verse 24, which I just read, we see this phrase. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. And he tells what that is, to testify to the grace of God. But it's this ministry that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul felt that his journey to Jerusalem was something that Jesus Christ directly commissioned him to do. It wasn't his own plan. It wasn't just what he felt like doing, because certainly it, it really wasn't what he felt like doing. If you read it, it's Jerusalem's just a stepping stone. Yeah, he, he wants to do it because it's good and because he loves the people, but he doesn't really want to be in Jerusalem because that's not his mission field. He's conceded that to the Jewish church, to the apostles. He wants to be in Rome, and he really wants to be in Spain. But the Lord Jesus commissioned to do it, though it wasn't his plan. He says, I don't care what's going to happen in Jerusalem. None of those things move me. I'm going to finish the thing that Jesus has given me to do. I believe that he felt in his heart that going to Jerusalem was something which the Lord Jesus Christ commissioned him to do. His motives were right all the way along the line. And I'll give you one other thought. The Spirit had been revealing to him, as I read in verse 23 of chapter 20, that imprisonment and afflictions await him. The Holy Spirit had shown him that it was going to be difficult, that he was going to have problems. But that was to be expected. Because chapter 9, verse 16, when he was converted, you'll remember, he was taken to the house at the end of the street called Straight, and Ananias heard from the Lord this regarding Paul. Ananias heard this, Go, for he is a chosen instrument, talking of Paul, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. From the very beginning that he converted to Christianity, that he was saved from that very moment, God was telling other people, this guy is going to suffer. And he did suffer. So this wasn't really a surprise at all. It wasn't a surprise for the Apostle Paul to hear from the Holy Spirit and from all those prophesying by the power of the Holy Spirit that he's going to go to Jerusalem and it's not going to be the best of times. It was the plan all along. So Paul was obedient. The message is this. Paul, don't go unless you're willing. Don't go unless you're willing to suffer for my sake. And he was. And that's the courage of conviction. And it was natural that his friends, who by prophetic spirit could foretell his plan, would try to talk him out of going. 
But Paul had no concern for safety, only for service. And he's like Jesus who set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. That is the courage of conviction, and it cannot be diverted. I want to end with this story. Soon after the beginning of the reign of Bloody Mary in England, an officer was sent to bring various preachers in for trial. And a particular officer went to take a preacher by the name of Hugh Latimer and to bring him to London. And Latimer had about six hours notice that these men, these officers were on their way or this officer was on his way to get him. But instead of running or fleeing, Latimer packed and prepared for his journey, a journey which he knew could end in execution. And when the officer arrived to take him, Latimer said this to him, My friend, come in. You're welcome. I go as willingly to London to give an account of my faith as ever I went to any place in the world. And I doubt not that as the Lord made me worthy formally to preach to two excellent princes, he will now enable me to bear witness to the truth before the third, either to her eternal comfort or discomfort. And so off he goes to London, and Bloody Mary burned him at the stake. She didn't just burn him alone, she burned two other preachers with him. And as the flames were leaping up, Latimer said this, We shall light a candle in England today that will never go out. The costliest fire the Roman Catholic Church ever lit was that fire. That became the flame that ignited the English Reformation and really led to the death of Catholicism in England. Latimer was a man who had conviction. He was a man who had the courage to die in flames for his conviction and the confidence to believe that in the sacrifice of his life, in giving it all, that God would bring his will and that God would be faithful to that conviction and that purpose and that cause. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would make us a church full of Jack Trices, that you would make us a church full of Hugh Latimer's, that you would make us a church full of those like the Apostle Paul and those who ministered alongside him and all the believers we see in the book of Acts who are consistently willing to give their lives for the sake of the gospel. They're willing to give their lives for a purpose and a cause. They're willing to do whatever it takes to know Christ and to not just know him from reading scripture. Now, the people in Acts, they didn't have a way to know Christ through reading scripture other than the Old Testament. They knew him by sharing in the power of the resurrection. They knew him by sharing in sufferings for his sake. Not just sitting on the sidelines and saying, thank you, Lord, that Jesus suffered for my sake. But they went on to the field, they went into the mission field, and they said, Lord, let me suffer for his sake. Let me return that favor. Let me have a conviction and give me the courage to see that conviction through. Give me the courage to see your plan that you have given to me, to see that through, to see that accomplished, and to know that if I perish, I have perished. Father, I pray that you would make this a church that is full of people who are courageously convicted and passionate for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us as we leave this place to find that objective that goes beyond just knowing Christ and knowing his suffering and knowing the resurrection, but that specific purpose that you would give to us today that may take us years to accomplish or may just last this day. Whatever that is, Lord, give us that purpose and give us the courage needed to see it through. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.